Foul as it is, hell itself is defiled by the fouler presence of John. This was the verdict of Matthew Paris, a monk writing in the 1230s. From Shakespeare to Hollywood, it's a reputation that has stuck. John has been portrayed in print, on stage, and in art as a weak, cruel and inept king. In the words of the song from Disney's Robin Hood, too late to be known as John the First, he's sure to be known as John the Worst. Is this reputation justified, though? What set John apart from his contemporaries, his father, Henry II, and elder brother, Richard I? Was he really John the Worst? To answer this, we have to first understand what was expected of a medieval king. Kings were expected to defend the law and to administer it fairly. They were to protect the church and to be pious. Kings were expected to be magnificent. Their court, personal appearance and conduct had to impress both their subjects and foreign visitors. And finally, kings were expected to be good warriors. Judged by these criteria, how good or bad was King John? John was certainly interested in the administration of justice, and with the loss of his family's lands in France, he had more time to spend in England, hearing these cases for himself. Thanks to his father's reforms, the royal courts now had a significant role to play in resolving local disputes, and John often intervened in cases directly. Some historians have interpreted this as a sign that John took seriously his duty to administer the law, as would a good king. Other historians, however, have stressed that John's motivation was financial, with the courts offering him the opportunity to impose heavy fees on his barons and to accept bribes. Whilst Henry's reforms had attempted to end the arbitrary nature of justice, the barons remained vulnerable to John's vindictive temperament and his tendency to sell justice to the highest bidder. As Henry II was widely held responsible for the murder of his Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket, the bar had not been set very high for John's relationship with the church. Tensions had been increasing for some time between the crown and the church, particularly over whose law was supreme and who should have the final say in appointing bishops. In John's reign, it was the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Walter, in 1205, that led to a crisis with local monks, John and the Pope Innocent III, disagreeing over who to appoint as his replacement. The Pope's preferred candidate was Stephen Langton, a biblical scholar who had spent most of his adult life in Paris. But John wanted one of his allies, John de Grey, to be appointed instead. The dispute escalated to the point where the Pope ordered the churches of England and Ireland to be closed for six years and the King was excommunicated, damning his soul to hell and inviting foreign princes to overthrow him. When it looked like the French might just do that, John submitted to the Pope, accepted Langton as his Archbishop and promised to return the church property he had seized. The Pope was now overlord of England, to whom John would pay an annual tribute for the rest of his reign. However, this was as much a tactical calculation as it was a surrender, and it certainly paid off during the Magna Carta crisis, when the Pope declared the Charter to be shameful and invalid. In terms of magnificence, John was a good medieval king. His court was lavish, and he was known for his love of precious jewels. However, the means that John used to raise money were extremely unpopular. He charged the City of London 3,000 marks in order to confirm their pre-existing liberties. He frequently charged his barons far in excess of the customary 100 pounds for their inheritance. And across the country, his sheriffs ruthlessly collected private debts. So unpopular were his sheriffs that one remains infamous to this day, the Sheriff of Nottingham. But Magnificent was not limited to material riches. This was an age of chivalry, where kings were expected to act honourably and piously. But John did not, nor did he seem to care. While it was common for kings to have mistresses, some of John's mistresses were the wives and daughters of his barons. John was also criticised by chroniclers for blasphemous outbursts and jokes. He was cruel, vindictive and paranoid and in not trusting anyone and turning on his former favourites, he too was trusted by no one. All of these transgressions and shortcomings, the cruelty, the quarrelling with the Pope, the heavy taxes, would have been bearable if John had passed the most important test of medieval kingship, winning battles. Henry II and Richard the Lionheart were great military leaders, and this, both at the time and since, has obscured many of their failings. 
When Richard died, the King of England, through an intricate network of inheritances and alliances, controlled more of France than the King of France himself. However, aside from one stunning military battle at the beginning of his reign over his 16-year-old nephew, John's military record was a string of disasters. The loss of Normandy, which began with the loss of Chateau Gaillard in March 1204, John's poor treatment of both allies and prisoners in France, and the death of his mother Eleanor, whose personal authority was instrumental in holding together the family's alliances in France, saw the unravelling of John's inheritance. By August, Anjou and Poitou had also fallen to Philip of France, leaving John with Aquitaine. John's efforts to reconquer these lands, for which so much money had been extracted at such a high political cost, also ended in failure at the Battle of Bovine in 1214. For over 50 years, England was ruled by strong-minded Angevin kings. Henry II, Richard and John were all passionate and intelligent men, but each had fierce tempers and cruel streaks which revealed themselves when their authority was challenged. Magna Carta was not the result of King John's reign alone. It was the culmination of decades of resentment at Angevin rule. However, whereas Henry and Richard had features which at least at the time redeemed them, John lacked the commanding presence of his father and the military prowess of his elder brother. Judged both by the standards of the time and today, John was indeed the worst. <laughs>